everyone. Welcome to the 371st episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Hagenbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Tofel. And we have a great show for you today. We're going to be talking about matter again with input from Google, maybe a little smart things action in there too. Plus, we are going to be talking about the rumored Sonos voice assistant and what that could mean. We're combining two of my favorite loves, RF Sensing and ML at the Edge in a brand new chip and service. We've also got some privacy news tied to a report on how ICE is using data. Qualcomm has a new robotics platform. We'll give you the 411 on that. Inmarsat has a new program for the IoT that focuses on their Ellora satellite platform. And we've got an acquisition between startups in the industrial IoT space that's worth a mention. Plus, we've got smart screws, which I, quite frankly, am super excited about. Yeah. And our guest this week is Mike Child, who is the VP of Product Management at Vivint, who's going to talk about the portfolio of new cameras that Vivint released. And we'll be talking also about developing smart services for the smart home. Okay, all of this and more awaits you. But first, a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Influx Data. Time series data is the secret to success when it comes to Industry 4.0. Why? IoT and industrial IoT applications depend on sensor data, and sensor data is time series data. So effectively collecting, managing, and analyzing time series data drives the ability to improve operations, increase quality, maximize asset of time, and more. Those are the key performance indicators that will help you maximize profits and reduce waste, no matter what the industry. The Influx DB platform enables you to put the power of time series data to work for your business. So check it out and get started for free at influxdata.com slash Stacy hyphen IOT. Okay, Kevin. First of all, I have to give a huge shout out to Jennifer Patterson Tui over at The Verge. She used to be at The Ambient and I think worked at Twell. And I have always loved her work. She's very smart, tests lots of smart home devices. If you're not following her, you totally should. And she has really been doing a great job dissecting Matter. And because we thought Matter was going to be out around now originally, they, they did delay it in March, I believe. But she's been doing a lot of Q&As with the big people behind Matter. So last week, she had a Q&A with the, Mark Benson, the head of Smart Things, about what it's doing with Matter. And this week, she's had Michelle Turner from Google on. And just to be clear, it's good timing because Google I.O. literally starts just after we finish recording this. So it's actually bad timing for us, but good timing for this conversation. Yes. In the newsletter, we will tell you all the things that Google said. But The big takeaways here are that Matter is going to be awesome for the smart home, but it's also not going to be as awesome possibly as we all think it's going to be. I feel like Matter is really like trying to level set here now that it's almost out. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One, I think people think interoperability with the smart home and they think more devices are going to be covered than actually are covered. So that's one. And two, I think that people think the standard is going to do more because when it was launched, it was solving a different problem. And that problem was like, I want to buy a thermostat, but I use Apple. And so I don't know if like this thermostat will work with my Apple smart home, right? So it will solve those problems for a certain set of devices. What it's not going to necessarily do is give you all the product features you might associate with something like HomeKey or Amazon's special senior services, like the Amazon Together services. Those are kind of things that are built on top of Matter as an interoperability platform, but they don't necessarily transcend all smart home platforms. And that makes sense because those aren't services or products that all of the platforms offer. They may eventually, and maybe a standard is created and added to Matter version two or 1.5 or whatever it might be. But it gets back to what you had said previously on the show or, or previous episode that the smart home has changed since Matter was announced first as Project Chip in 2019. So it can't solve all the problems that were 
issues back then because some of them already have been solved without matter. Yeah. And I do think it will solve some things that we're kind of more attuned to now. So like with Insteon, for example, the death of Insteon, people were like, oh crap, it is really important to have devices that could be controlled maybe by more than one brain in case somebody's brain goes out of business, right? Insteon's a little different because it wasn't just a brain, it was a proprietary wireless protocol. But that proprietary wireless protocol actually will still work locally. It just won't work with other things, right? But the loss of Insteon as a company meant the Insteon brain that allows you to control that stuff via, you know, your smartphone or tie into cloud services, that's all gone. And I think the average consumer is not going to be aware of those things. That's a real subtle distinction to make. So I think in some cases, Matter will do what we think by basically making the smart home work as we always thought it should. But that may not make everybody like... (laughs) <laughs> basically saying to someone, hey, this thing works like you think it should when you originally bought it is not something that people are going to celebrate. They're going to be like, well, thank you about darn time, right? Or they might, might have already moved on to a different device. <laughs> yeah. Quite honestly. Or said, screw this smart home thing. I know I have not, not said screw the smart home thing. I've moved on to different devices. Yeah. So the idea of this like smarter, more proactive smart home, it'll be Mm. built on top of matter, but Mm -hmm. I don't think it'll be like matter is not going to enable that. And that kind of ties into something you wrote about this week and something I think is really important to talk about. Yeah. It's kind of a conglomeration of that interview that JP did with Michelle and the news that Sonos is apparently creating its own voice assistant for its products. The word on the street, again from The Verge actually, is that in June we will see this or hear it depending on how you look at this. And it will be a software upgrade to the newer Sonos devices. And if you're familiar with Sonos speakers, I mean, they, they've long been around to move music throughout the home. I mean, we're talking, what, 15 years probably, and I guess become, I'd say, the de facto leader, save for connected speakers from Apple, Amazon, and Google, which can sort of do the same thing now. And Sonos currently does work with Madam A, which is Amazon's digital assistant and Google's assistant, but they're doing their own thing. And at first I thought, well, that's just dumb. And I'm thinking most people probably would think the same thing. But I thought about it for about a day and I'm like, you know what? Maybe they're onto something in that device-specific assistance could be more useful, more intuitive, provide a better experience for the smart home. So maybe we shouldn't be talking to our smart home and these third-party intermediaries, so to speak, such as the the three digital assistants, the three main ones, but to the devices themselves through smart speakers, like instead of worrying about what the name of certain lights are to turn them on, just say, hey, lights. And there's a whole industry of people who are actually like doing local ML for like wake word mm-hmm. detection. They're saying, hey, why don't you use something like that? And so you could just talk to that. That device doesn't actually have to be connected to the internet, for example, in this scenario. Right. So yeah, hey lights, turn on if you're in the in the vicinity. Or hey lock or whatever it might be. I think back to something that actually Michelle said in the interview with, with Jennifer. If we create something like a connected light and it's not as fast as the old light switch, what value are we adding? And when you're interacting with devices themselves, whether it's through a smart speaker that talks to the device or however we can make this work it probably would be immediate. Like Sonos says, this is all going to be done locally. None of your voice recordings will get sent to the cloud. It'll be processed on device, et cetera, et cetera, low latency. And I'm like, yeah, that's what we want. And how do we do that? Well, as you said, Matter kind of gives us the information because it has a standardized format that each device says, here are all my capabilities, here's my current state, et cetera, et cetera. So I call it like the foundational glue that this consumer to device interaction could take place. But yes, it would have to be built on top of that. You wouldn't actually even need matter because if you, unless you wanted that interoperability with other devices and like things like with Sonos. Oh, I do. Well, I know you do, but some people may be like, eh, it's not worth it. It's too complicated. But just being able to say, hey, play this music. 
would be helpful. Actually, that would need a cloud unless you have a local Sonos server that you're pulling from, which right. I used to run. <laughs> well, go take that one step further because this came up in the interview as well of proactive things happening in your smart home, something we've been talking about for years now, you know, the smarter smart home. And one of the examples I put in the story was the smart, smarter lights say, hey, TV, I noticed that we get dimmer when you turn on every night around seven, eight, whenever it is. How about you shoot us a message when this happens and we'll just dim when you do your thing. And now you've got like a proactive routine that has been self-learned. Right. By doing this type of device to device communication. And I think what we need to do here and what is going to happen is the separation of the digital assistant, so the smart home brain, and the idea of a, a smart speaker or voice interaction. So, voice interaction could be you might talk to Madam A, but you might also just use voice interaction to interact with any other device in your home. Yes. And those devices may also have some sort of interplay with your brains of your smart home, but that digital assistant is something different. So we're seeing a separation there. I do get worried though, that with branded voice assistants, we're going to have this cognitive load of remembering who the heck I'm talking to. So if I'm saying, if all of my speakers are Sonos and I just say, play this song, then that's fine. Cause they'll be listening for it and they'll do it. Right. If I have, you know, my hue lights and my GE sync lights, then I might have to make a distinction there. And that gets like hard. Yeah, I would agree. And in the article, I talked about the naming of devices and that's just as hard because mm -hmm. if I set up the devices in my home, which I do, I name them in ways that are logical to me, but no one in my family can control the individual devices because they don't know the names and they get frustrated. So I say, get rid of the brands, just keep it as device types. What do you interact with? When you want to play music, you interact with a speaker you say, hey, speakers. Well, then Sonos doesn't need to create their own digital assistant because you would use the brains of the smart home to do it. You would use the context that someone's standing in front of the speaker saying the phrase, hey, speakers, and wants to turn on music. Yeah. I Kevin's like, say, wait, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're right. You're right. I, I don't think Sonos has the end all be all solution. I think they're on the right path and we remove the word Sonos from this path completely and just stick with device types. When you go to turn on a light in a non-smart home, you go to what? A light switch. So let's abstract that into this new smart home world and say, hey, light or hey, switch, turn on. That's it. I don't care who made it. If they all can work together because of theoretically matter, then the branding goes away. The naming goes away. We go back to the old ways of, that's a switch. Switch, turn on. Okay. I feel like we should separate the voice assistant from the smarts, but I do think mm. they're going to end up working together. Oh, so I agree with that. Adding just basic voice assistants to your product is probably going to be like pretty easy and just as similar as making sure you have a volume knob or an LED that indicates, you know, status. So, and the thing I should say that makes all this possible is cheaper machine learning at the edge. We've talked about Ooh. chips coming out. Arm actually, was it last week? They announced their IP blocks for wake words, like local wake words on devices. And this week I have got news from a company called Imagibob, Imagimob. I'm going to go with Imagimob. And they have combined two of my favorite things in the world, which is TinyML, yay, and RF sensors, which is basically using Wi-Fi or radar, any kind of radio waves, RF, to sense gestures or movements in the home. So instead of using cameras, you're going to use radios. And what they've done is they have used a, they've basically built something that runs on top of TI radar detection chips. And these will detect falls and some gesture recognition. So you just put this low power radar sensor on a wall or in an appliance and the Imagimob ML will detect if the person in the room falls over or it will recognize six different types of gestures. I am so excited about this because this is like, to me, where the future should go. You don't have to have connectivity back to the cloud although you probably want to, to say, hey, by the way, someone just fell. Otherwise, you could just like have a light go on outside their room if it's in like a care, a care home setting. But 
I'm really excited about this application. Yeah. Yeah, you don't need big honking servers or compute chips either because these run on small microcontrollers. All of the machine learning algorithms just take place on these. Which means it's battery powered, which means you could stick this little puck on the wall in a bathroom and boom, fall detection. fall away. Try not to, but yes. (laughs) All right. And the reason this is important, or one reason, is because we don't want cameras in our bathroom, for example, because of the privacy implications. So let's talk about privacy because, my goodness, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, ICE, is at it again. There is a new report out from researchers at Georgetown Law Center on Privacy and Technology that basically talks about how ICE is using data from a bunch of different sources, including facial recognition data, to investigate adults and figure out if they need to be deported. They have the driver's license data on 74% of adults. They already are using it in the U.S. Yeah, it's a U.S. agency, but yes. They automatically get new updates on people's addresses. So basically, they're tracking. They have the ability to track us based on our face. They can use facial recognition to like find us. And then they can also find out where we live pretty easily. And I mean, it's scary that they have this access to data, but ICE also has... They have the ability to detain people and you don't actually have to give them a trial quickly or anything like that. It's it's a very like it's a scary agency that doesn't have the processes we normally associate with US law. And that's scary. Yeah, it's it's concerning. I mean, it follows up on last week's report, and we talked about this on the show last week of the CDC in the US getting a lot of data for COVID. Pulling real-time location data yeah. from Brokers, data brokers. So what happens is tech firms will collect this data and then they will sell it to many companies for advertising, for any sort of thing. But the government is also buying this data. And that leads to, with the power that the government has, that leads to a lot of questions. And in last week's newsletter, we talked about this in the context of the leaked Supreme Court opinion about Roe v. Wade, noting that if something like this becomes illegal, There is a lot of data available that tech companies have that the state could then use to prosecute people who might have abortions. And that's very scary. Mm -hmm. This concerns me more than the CDC thing, only because of the power that ICE has has in in this country. The fact that they are getting data from utility companies for people who hook up or disconnect service to track where they're going. You know, if you're an immigrant, you're not documented and you get service and in 16 states and in DC, you can get a driver's license. Well, ICE is probably going to, I don't want to say ICE is going to find you, but you just made it a lot easier without even knowing. And that's, it's just not, not good. It is not good. And it's upsetting. And we need to have laws that govern how this data can be used by the state. And right now we don't have that. And the state is unlikely to give that to us because they would love to have this data. Not only that, like when we buy devices, we tend to, you and I, um, hopefully everybody, but I know not everybody does. And I don't do it all the time either, I'll, I'll admit. We look at a device and we're like, what do they do with the data? You know, what's their privacy policy? Do I say, yes, we read the terms of service completely? No, but that's for devices. I never thought to ask my public utility company what they do with my data. Mm. Now we need to start like asking that question for anything. Well, yes. crazy. And I will say, I mean, the U.S. Postal Service has sold your data forever. That's why when you move, you get all the... Yes. I think people are still unaware of how easy it is with computers to aggregate, collect, and make inferences about this data that are incredibly accurate and incredibly cheap to do. Whereas before it took a lot of actual physical legwork to get all this. Right. So I agree. Those computers are going to be a thing in the future. They're a thing today. All right. Let's talk about robots. Let's, let's move from, well, one scary topic to another. No, this is, (laughs) this is just a little brief. Qualcomm this week announced a platform for 5G wireless networking and edge AI applications, including robotics. So Qualcomm is famous for marrying the brains and the connectivity together. That is what Qualcomm does. In this case, they're marrying the brains needed for edge AI, so for robotics control, to 5G 
networking. And the reason they're doing this is because 5G is coming out, release 17 is out. So now we're getting really good factory compliant 5G, where you can have lots of devices, super low latency, and manage those. And that means things like 5G controlled robotics in a factory in the next year or so could become actually real as opposed to theorized. I'm just going to say it because I have to. Do it. NVIDIA came out with a robotics platform a couple months back, and now Qualcomm follows. Right. But Qualcomm does have the, the modems and the radios for connectivity that NVIDIA does not. So, right. still. Well, Qualcomm has had to do this massive in the last 10 years transition from like selling basically 3G and 4G chips to cell phone providers, right? That, I mean, that was, mm-hmm. they were like, the cell phone people are our customers to all of a sudden having to sell chips to everybody because they realized that cell phone connectivity was going to be everywhere because of IoT. So it makes sense. All right. Moving right along, Inmarsat has launched an IoT platform. You're like, wait, what? They've already had this. So Inmarsat launched their satellite platform for IoT called Ellera. Now they've created around Ellera a package of services called Elevate. And Elevate basically is just going to make it really easy for companies to use the Ellera platform. That is that is really what it does. But Inmarsat Elevate is going to, it'll have a development platform for solutions providers. So like SIs, if you're building something and you want to put satellite on it, Elevate will help you do that as long as you're using the Ellera platform. And then they've got a partner ecosystem. So where if you are like, oh, I need satellite connectivity for some part of my service, you can go through that and get something that uses the Inmarsat Ellera platform. And the third element is an online marketplace where you can find this stuff really easily. And this is a packaging move, but it's important because packaging is really essential when you're not used to building connected stuff. So this is good. This does show that Inmarsat is very serious about Ellera. Good news for them. Other industrial news, a company called Augury has acquired SIBO for, it's a combination of cash and stock deal value between $100 million and $200 million. I think it's important because, well, I've written about both of these companies. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> Augury uses vibration data and sound data to track machine health, and SIBO does Process intelligence. Basically, Augury's doing some local processing. SIBO does it on a a kind of a more macro level. The combination of the two is, it's fine. It's, you know, if you're in industrial. Makes sense. Yeah, if you're in industrial automation, basically you're going a level up from the sensor to like a little bit more integration there. What's interesting to me is you're going one level up there with like, how it will help with the overall health of the factory and facility, or maybe that entire process line as opposed to the individual machine. So Augury, individual machine, SIBO, more the whole process. What's interesting to me is it shows a maturing of this industry because what always happens is you come out with these point solutions and they do feel almost like more like features than a whole solution. And then you drive those solutions together and you package them together. What's fun is this is a startup buying another startup, basically, as opposed to like a big player like Emerson or Johnson Controls or someone coming in and buying these companies and, and packaging it up on their own. I, I just think it's it could actually be used to create a new industrial IoT company or the combined augury will get bought by one of those big players, whichever. Okay. Let's talk about screws. This is like my favorite story of the week. (laughs) This is a cool story. And kudos to Gizmodo, who noticed the research out of the Fraunhofer Cluster of Excellence Cognitive Internet Technology, CCIT. That group of researchers has created a smart, self-powered screw. And the idea here is not for building your home and knowing if it's still in one piece when you leave but instead for large projects such as bridges, cranes, scaffolding, roller coasters, that would be- (laughs) Roller coasters was my favorite. (laughs) Yeah, that should be use case number one in my book. But what happens is these screws, as they are tightened, the screws have a small pre-attached washer with a thin film of piezo-resistive material. So there's electrical resistance measured as the screw is tightened. 
and there are sensors that measure the force of that torque, basically. What happens if the screw becomes loose over time, there's less pressure, so there's less resistance from an electrical standpoint, and these screws can actually send that data over a low power network. In this particular case, I believe they're using, is it Myoti? I think it's Myoti, and we'll talk about that in a second, but you tell them about okay. the screw first. Yeah. Well, it sends that data over a network, which we'll talk about, and that way, whoever is monitoring those, whether it's a person, a process, a server, et cetera, can then share that data with whoever needs to know that, like, hey, you need to go tighten these screws, and that could prevent accidents. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, I found it. I'm glad they do this. And, and the issue is like, hey, and we've, I don't know if we've all had this happen, but, you know, screws get loose over time. It wind, the force of a roller coaster going over it. And apparently in amusement parks, people individually go and look to see that all the screws are tightened on these roller coasters every morning, which thanks for doing that. I appreciate that, Disney and Six yeah, Flags. Yeah. It's a big deal. We do have like bridge inspections once a year, but catastrophic bridge failures are not Ugh. not uncommon and really terrible. So this sort of thing is, I like it for a couple of reasons. It is the self-powering part of it and the, the sensing part of it's really just easy, right? It's low, low intelligence, basically. I don't know how it's, so that makes it cheaper, hopefully, and less complicated. It's low maintenance. Yeah, low maintenance. Thank you. And the Miyoti network it's worth talking about. This is actually a proprietary network. It's built on Silicon Labs chips. It's commodity hardware, but the software, the radio protocol itself is proprietary. It's from a Canadian company called Bear Technologies. I've written about it before, but this is for something people love calling massive IoT, which is millions of sensors just giving out data to a node somewhere. And Miyoti it can transfer up to 1.5 million messages per day within a radius of 5 to 15 kilometers, but it's only going to be able to transfer like 407 bits per second. But that's all you need if you're yeah. measuring something like this. Screw loose. So it's, again, low maintenance, low complicated, and the technology can last up to 20 years in the field on a battery. So this is a very specific industrial use case, but I love it. I love the idea of these screws just kind of basically alerting when they have a problem. <laughs> I want these on my motorcycle. Yeah. I mean, it's possible if you can make them cheap enough, you'll have this everywhere. And this is kind of this yeah. vision of the IoT with the trillion sensors. And we kind of have to stop thinking about them like we think about servers and start thinking about them more like we think about, like I don't know, disposable tags. And this is right. a good example of that. Anyway. These screws are amazing. That's the bottom line. They're not deployed anywhere yet. It's just research at this stage. But I'd love to see that because I think that's where we're going. Okay. We're going to talk about this later, but this week, Vivint also announced a whole new lineup of cameras. We're not talking about it in this segment of the show because our guest is going to talk all about this, but it's worth mentioning because they've got this new feature called Smart Deter, which ties into this idea that the smart home needs to be smarter. And Smart Deter, what it does is when these cameras detect someone staying around and they don't, they detect a person like in the system is armed, it'll proactively close the loop. It just won't send you a notification. It'll actually proactively make a noise or strobe a light for you. And I like that it is a little bit more than just like, oh, someone's approaching your car. We're going to record their face, you know, as they approach your car and break in. They're really trying to like, be a little bit more aggressive on the don't break inside, which I like. Yeah, that that example, there's no deterrence whatsoever. It's capturing somebody maybe after Yeah, so we'll talk about what it takes to do that with our guest who helped build these products. So it'll be fun. But first, we're going to do the Internet of Things podcast hotline, which is the segment of the show where we listen to you. You can give us a call at 512-623-7424 and... Ask us a question, and we may play it on the air, and we may answer it. But you'll certainly be entered to win our prize for the month of May, which is an Ember self-heating coffee mug, just because it's awesome, and I feel like everyone would enjoy this. So our question this week comes from Adam, who's in my home state of Washington, located in Woodenville. By the way, y'all, Woodenville whiskey is delicious. Just throwing that out there. Okay, let's hear our call from Adam. 
Hello, this is Adam Forney calling from Woodenville, Washington. My question is as follows. So I'm a bit of a, a geek, and I, I recently earned my technician class uh, license for uh, ham radio. And it got me thinking a lot about, I guess, decentralized communication. And it occurred to me that, you know, LoRa, LoRaWAN, uh, Amazon Sidewalk, all these newer protocols and, and Spectrum, they, they would be fantastic for, for example, off-grid SMS or instant messaging uh, between people when you're camping or maybe when the, uh, the grid is congested. And I was wondering if anybody has developed anything uh, like that so far. Uh, I've seen a few mentions on Instructables or on uh, Make Magazine, but as far as I can find, there's no protocol or uh, device that's being manufactured to take advantage of this form of, uh, I guess, instant messaging. Thank you. So I don't know if you remember, but as soon as Amazon announced the Sidewalk Network, I don't remember when it was, maybe two years ago? Uh, it was 2019, actually. Oh, my. He yeah, had a pandemic. Sorry. Pandemic calendar. The very first thing I said is, Wow, a long-range, low-power wireless network that could theoretically cover everything would be so cool to use for messaging. And you're right. <laughs> but the, well, Adam's got the right idea, I think, yes. But it hasn't happened, and I don't think it will, because what would it accomplish? So first, it would be very cheap, because you can buy data on these low power networks, 10,000, a million messages for like a buck. But we already have messaging kind of built into our all of our service plans for our phones and such. So it's not going to really save you money because you're already paying for it. Two, it would possibly give you more coverage in areas where cellular data is not readily available. And that is good. But at least here in the US, and I don't want to just talk about the US, but here in the US, there's really not a big market for that because it's there aren't that many holes of coverage where lots of people need to communicate. I'm not saying there aren't any. I, I know people are immediately writing comments right now saying, I live in the middle of Wyoming, Montana, wherever it may be. And you know we have no coverage when I go out to the ranch to look at the cattle. And oh, I get it. I get it. But it's not a huge market. That's that's my point. So I don't think people are going to invest or companies are going to invest time and effort into hardware development, making their devices work on these networks and so on for just this type of functionality. There have been some attempts at this though, Stacey, you found one before that I think you've talked about. There's a couple. So way back in the day, like 2014, I wrote about something that ran on Android devices and I had it running on my phone. It was called Serval. And it created a peer-to-peer -peer mesh network with anyone running Serval on their phone and just one phone. So you could talk to anybody using like Wi-Fi, the local peer-to-peer -peer network that was created on your phone using this. And if you wanted to go out to the broader internet, someone had to have like a an actual connection to the internet. There also is a project that you might be interested in. It's called Commotion Wireless. And this actually, it's a DIY <laughs> wireless network for now. I, I don't remember if Commotion, <laughs> I believe it runs over Wi-Fi. And the thing you've got to know about these types of networks is... So something has to have the same radio to send a message to another device with the same radio, right? So you've got to think about your radios. If you're talking about using Sidewalk or LoRa, you know, that's fine. But those devices, somebody has to have, the network still has to have a server somewhere within that local network. So it could be like a server running on your phone. It could be like an actual standalone server with the LoRa radio on it that's routing the messages, right? So there has to be some sort of software and hardware component that's powerful enough to route messages within your local network. And if you want to go back out to the internet and talk to somebody who's not on that local network, that server or whatever device has to have backhaul to the internet. And that's complicated. <laughs> it is. I like the idea, obviously. I mean, it's Adam's thinking exactly where I was thinking back in 2019. And to be honest, I still think it's a good question. It might be a fun proof of concept. I had built a basic chat app with a node server and a JavaScript interface that I used with a couple of my friends. And I'm like, you know what? After listening to Adam's call, I'm like, yeah, maybe it would be cool to like try and port that over to a device with a LoRa radio and figure out just how to do it. But I don't think we're going to see it, unfortunately. 
Yeah. So Commotion, look it up. It's commotionwireless.net. There is also, there's a couple other projects. There's something called Rumble. And Rumble uses Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to create a, it's an ad hoc network. So it's a peer-to-peer ad hoc network that sends and forwards messages. And then there's also something called Project Span that is designed to run over Android. And I think there's actually an app that you can actually download. It's called Maynet Manager. And you can put this on any Android device and build your own smartphone ad hoc network. Again, this is going to not use LoRaWAN because that's not on your phone. So I know this is not, and it's complicated and buggy because it's, it's an open source project, like a true open source project. The thing, Kevin, I think you were alluding to is there was a company called Orion Labs, and that was created, oh man, so long ago, like 2014, 2015. And basically they were trying to do a peer-to-peer local network for camping devices, actually. It was walkie-talkie kind of things. And they thought it'd be good for like emergency responders and firefighters and that sort of thing. What happened is they couldn't build a business on it because it's a pretty specific use case. As Kevin mentioned, we have really good wireless coverage, so it's not it's not really necessary. Here we do. Here, Here we, we do. do. I could yes. see in certain continents and countries around the world where this could be very beneficial. But there's not a lot of people there. And so it's hard to build a business case for something because there's not a lot of people in those remote areas with bad cell coverage. They don't have cell coverage because they don't have density. And without density, it's hard to sell them products, right? Exactly. But Orion kind of, they're still out there. They pivoted to adding cloud services and... Now they're like field worker stuff. It's actually really cool technology for people who work in the field, but it's probably not going to be something you're after. So there's a lot there. You're not wrong. You're going to have to DIY it. And if you want to use LoRaWAN, I don't actually know if there's software out for that because most of them work on Bluetooth and Wi-Fi for cell phones. But let us know if you build something. All right, Adam, thanks for such a good question. And remember, if you have a question for us, give us a call at 512-623-7424, and you will be entered to win an Ember self-heating coffee mug. Woo! That concludes this portion of the show, but please stay tuned for our guest, Mark Child of Vivint, talking about how they built their smart deter and why and some of the things they thought about with that. And before that, it's time for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is the Laura Wan World Expo. Hey everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is the Laura Wan Expo. And I have Michael McKenzie, who is from AWS and is a speaker at the Laura Wan Expo, here to talk to us. So, Michael, why don't you tell us a little bit about this year's Laura Wan World Expo? Thanks for having me. The LoRaWAN World Expo is the largest LoRaWAN event ever. It's going to be an in-person event at the Palais de Congress in Paris, July 6th to 7th. The theme this year is Discover the Power of LoRaWAN, and the expo is the industry's most authoritative event about LoRaWAN technology, including discussions about how it's going to drive IoT business success and how it enhances the quality of life for the planet and its citizens. Awesome. So I know why I'm excited about LoRaWAN, but why are you excited about the technology? You know, we launched a managed LoRaWAN service at AWS about a year ago, and we've seen some really interesting IoT use cases uh, enabled by adding LoRaWAN sensors and technologies to those architectures. So particularly in smart buildings, we have this great ability to use LoRaWAN sensors as peel and stick sensors for things like people counting and people tracking to understand how many people are coming into a meeting room, which is particularly important when we're talking about return to office and maintaining social distance, but also so that we can get the most out of the spaces that we're using in these buildings. We also see really big uses in that longer range technology, working in oil and gas and water wastewater, smart grid, all sorts of great applications where There's really long distances for a signal to travel in an area where there might be low service drops. So we're starting to see really cool stuff happening in those sectors and allowing our customers and allowing people to better monitor things 
get better results out of their systems and start to take action on on things that they may not have been able to monitor previously. And why are you personally excited to participate in the expo? I'll actually be speaking at the expo and talking a lot about the service that we've launched, some of the great customer use cases that we've enabled and empowered at AWS using LoRaWAN. And I'm really excited to meet other companies, talk to customers who are using this technology in the field, and really see how people are getting value out of LoRaWAN. Awesome. So where can people go to register for the LoRaWAN World Expo? You bet. The LoRaWAN World Expo is July 6th to 7th in Paris. For more information and to go register, you go to www.lora-alliance.org. Can't wait to see you there. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is Mike Child, who is VP of Product Management at Vivint. Hello, Mike. How are you today? Hey, Stacy. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on today. I am really excited. I found out that you designed one of my favorite all-time doorbells. You designed the original Vivint doorbell. So such an honor. Uh- <laughs> Glad to hear that you're a fan of it. That was a that was a fun product, you know, early on in the in the development of smart doorbell cameras. Uh, we were one of the first to market, and that was a fun product to work on. Indeed. Yeah. Y'all launched the buffering, um, the ability to be able to see what happened because it was always, rec- well, it wasn't always recording. It always had it available and would toss it out, you know, if it didn't hit the actual formal record button. But um, it was super fun. Loved it. And now y'all just launched a bunch of new products. We're going to talk about that. And I'm really excited to get into some of the design decisions that y'all made and talk about adding what I think are some really smart AI features. So, To help orient everyone, if they are not aware, can you just run us through some of the products that y'all announced this week? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, Yeah, so we're excited to to really introduce a number of new products this year, mostly in the video space, really, uh, starting with our Next Generation Outdoor Camera Pro, as well as our Next Generation Doorbell Camera Pro. Uh, And and as an accessory on the Outdoor Camera Pro, uh, later on, we'll be releasing uh, what we're calling the Spotlight Pro. Do you want to tell us what the spotlight does? Because it is it is pretty cool. Yeah, no, happy. So, so what it does is, as I mentioned, it leverages the intelligence of the camera. So we've, you know, over the years, we've continued to build out um, our, our artificial intelligence to make sure that we're able to detect things accurately and at distances and quickly. And we're using all of that intelligence now and pairing it with a spotlight that is an accessory for the camera. So it can be added on to any outdoor camera pro uh, of this newer generation. And, and what it does is it has nine independent light zones on it that cover a 180 degree array. And so each of those zones can be controlled independently. And so what will happen is this, if somebody comes onto your property, uh, this camera will not only just know that there is somebody there, but where they're on your property and be able to focus that light directly on that person And as they begin to then move across your property, this light using those nine independent zones can actually then follow or track that person across your property. And that's kind of the first stage of helping to deter and keep things safe, as well as if it's you as the the homeowner, be able to kind of light up your path. And then if that person is there when they shouldn't be there and they're staying for longer than they should be, it can then escalate. And that's when it gets back into what our current generation of pro cameras have done, which is uh, light up the the red light ring on the front, as well as play a whistle or another tone to kind of grab attention to let that person know that they're being recorded. And now you pair that with this light and this light can actually escalate that experience too by, by either strobing or doing a wave effect and really draw attention to both itself as well as to the person who's on your property who shouldn't be there. And all that combines to really help, again, make people safer, make homes safer, you know, help help be proactive on deterring crime instead of just recording it. Yeah, I, I, I like this because I think for years we, we've become accustomed to the video doorbells, right? We're like, oh, a lot of properties have cameras around them, so I'm going to get stuck on video. So what happens is you get people, you know, maybe covering their face, maybe kind of sneaking around the edges. I like that. Y'all have escalated it in a way that feels pretty good. So we'll talk about that that decision. And I also like 
my in-laws actually had a ongoing spat with one of their neighbors for years related to their outdoor security lights shining over into someone's bedroom. So I'm also like practically being able to say, okay, I'm going to still have my security light, but it's only going to light down into the left as opposed to to the right where my neighbor's bedroom is. Feels like, oh, I mean, this this was like a McCoy's versus the Hatfield feud. So I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly right. I mean, with that 180 degree, uh, you know, Build of illumination that the site provides, you'll always be able to illuminate what you want to and what you need to, like your driveway or you know your, your property. But but we because we have those nine independent light zones, we really do make it easy for customers to toggle off any that that may be in that situation where where it is shining you know directly into your neighbor's house or neighbor's windows at nights. There we go. Maybe I, maybe I should call them. So let's go big picture before we get into some of these features and how y'all develop them. Big picture. We have seen, y'all have been doing this a while. I've been doing this a while. We've really seen an evolution in the smart home where we're like, oh, we've got a bunch of gadgets. They're fun. They work independently. Some of them are like glorified remote controls. And now we're starting to build these experiences. Talk to me how Vivint has kind of evolved from providing, and y'all were a security company before the smart home. So y'all have always had an experiential perspective. So how has that kind of influenced the early designs and then where you're going now. Yeah, no, I think I think you nailed it. Yeah, we security is at our core. I mean, that that was what we did for a long time before moving into the the smart home and the automation and some of these other spaces. And, and you're right, that has been an evolution really across the industry. And, and frankly, it's an area that we need to keep doing better at because I don't think we're still doing quite well enough as as an industry in the space, which is really starting with what are the experiences that we can deliver and what are the what are the jobs that we're actually solving and the jobs to be done is a framework that we'll oftentimes talk about it's you know customers are are buying our products because they want it to solve a problem for them and oftentimes we're making that solution too difficult whether it requires too much you know customization to set up properly or whether it has too many um, reliability challenges or or doesn't leverage all those other gadgets that are also connected that, that could be leveraged to deliver a better experience. No, it's there's a business model function here, right? There's the, hey, we are a security company, we sell you hardware, we sell you the services built on that hardware. Broadly speaking, when you think about bringing in other products, what are the limitations of bringing that into your service? Because that creates a dependency perhaps. And and I think you're talking about things like arming or disarming using like a voice assistant, but can you kind of talk about the decision on when to bring in an outside product and how far into the service you could bring it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a, it, it's definitely a question that we're, we're constantly asking of which products do we bring in and integrate? It, it really comes down to, again, I'm going to sound like I'm repeating myself on some of these areas. It's like, what, what's the experience that we, that we want to deliver? And is that what is required to help us deliver it in a better way? Uh, uh, certainly there are, you know, business implications anytime you're looking at a, a third party partnership and, and Vivint, uh, you know, draws a hard line in certain areas around, you know, things like data privacy. And, and so that may limit some of the deeper integrations with, with companies out there who have their business be the business of selling data, you know. So there's considerations along those lines that we're that we're constantly uh, keeping in mind. So let's talk about one of the features that y'all launched, and this is this is bringing more AI into things, and I and I love it. So it is called Smart Deter. Do you want to tell us what it is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, it's what I was alluding to earlier, where uh, we really took that insight of pe- people don't want to just record crime with their outdoor cameras. Um, that that's that's helpful. I certainly don't want to record somebody breaking in. I'm like, oh no, that's terrible. Obviously, never hope they have a break in, right? And that's actually one of the things customers do too is they they want cameras to help even like bring awareness to hopefully make somebody not even want to attempt a crime on your property or whatever. But but even beyond that, then like cameras typically were really focused on you know providing live footage if you were happen to be looking at the camera or providing historical footage if you had it recorded. But but really, was there an opportunity there, and that we feel like there was to to help be more proactive in that space. You know, customers wanted it to help make their home safer. And you, you were alluding to it, you know, I don't want, I don't want the crime to even happen. And, and so we took that and uh, we, we even went to customers and asked them a similar question along those lines, which was, do you want your outdoor camera to stand out on your home or do you want it to blend in with your home? 
And it was really interesting as we started to get the data back on that. Um, first with the survey, it was just split right down the middle. It was like 50-50 exactly. It was incredible. Uh, and then we started talking to customers and trying to understand like their rationale, why they answered the way they did. And it turned out even on an individual basis, uh, customers were split on, on what they wanted it to do. And what it really came down to is they wanted it to blend in and you know be beautiful on their home under normal conditions, you know, if it's your family, if it's your friends, you don't want to have a bunch of cameras that are standing out making people feel like they're uncomfortable on your on your property if it's if it's your own family. But if it's a bad actor, if it's somebody there who's peeking into your car windows at night on your driveway, you absolutely want that outdoor camera to stand out. And so we took that insight and said, well, how can we build something that does both? And that really resulted in this deter experience, which is again the camera can really, you know, look beautiful against the home, blend in nicely, you know, look, look, look really great up there. But then if it detects somebody standing on your property or lingering on your property when they shouldn't be there for the time that you've decided is too long, the camera then draws attention to itself by playing a sound, lighting up the, the light ring on the front of the camera and really drawing attention to itself. And on our doorbell, it'll even have a recording as an option to announce that the camera's recording and you're being captured on video. And we found that that like that bringing that awareness to that camera really does help with that deter where people, you know, if they're most crime is opportunistic, people looking, you know, for open car doors and things like that. When that camera whistles and the light ring lights up, we've gotten video clip after video clip sent into us of people take off running as soon as that happens. And so that was that that smart deter feature that we built into really all of our pro cameras and that we're continuing to build on. And was that beep just the smart deter or is it a little louder? <laughs> yeah, I, I heard a little beep too. I don't, that, that, as far as I know, that wasn't it. But, but customers can choose from a number of different sounds. And so I keep mentioning the whistle sound because that's by far our most popular. As, as we talk to, to users about why they select that one, they kind of like the human element of a whistle. You know, it's even, even more so than, a, than technology grabbing your attention. It almost it sounds human-like. Mm -hmm. And so that's by far our most popular tone, but, but there are beeping and, you know, the other things that people can choose to, depending on, uh, depending on what they prefer. And I wanted to actually have a signal that's like, Hey, neighbor, get off my lawn with your dog. I, I thought that would be really helpful because we, we actually get a lot of questions from people. They're like, Oh my gosh, I've got this one neighbor, their dog poops on my lawn. I'd love to have a sound that when it, they see the dog that it just, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, yells at it. it's, it's not, <laughs> Not, not, not an uncommon request, actually. It's a, it's a space that we're, uh, we're looking into still. We, we haven't allowed customers to, to make their own, their own deter sounds just yet. Uh, something we continue looking into, but we, we do want to express or, or, or exercise a little bit of caution in giving people full, uh, full control on, on having the Vivint cameras say whatever they want it to. We want to make sure it's aligned with our overall brand image and everything. But but I think the, the use case you just called out is absolutely uh, a use case that's that, that we've heard consistently, too. So uh, we'll, we'll keep and that, that's a great thing about, you know, having technology like this is you can keep making it better. We can keep uh, sending out new updates and adding more features. And so um, so don't be too surprised if one day we uh, we, we send you a, a new feature to help help address that for you. Well, something that would address it, we again, another thing we get a lot of requests for is tying my security system like that to my sprinkler system. So with Smart Deter, suddenly it'll you, you could see that, hey, someone's hanging out here too long, or I see, I assume, can Smart Deter like detect things like animals? So we, we today focus on people is what okay. we have at this point, which is really being accurate on people detection. But uh, again, in theory, in, in the future, something that we could do. Yeah. Well, also, you know, you might have an animal like a bear rumbling around in your trash can. Although if there was a bear in my trash can, I would want the deter to go off. <laughs> I'm yeah. like, hmm. yeah. yeah um, okay. One of those crazy clips too. So that, that's, that's, yeah, that happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, but tying that back to something like a sprinkler, that's, that's obviously not something you offer. It doesn't feel like it's in a security company's wheelhouse. So then you're looking at partnering with a company like Rachio or Rainbird. And can you talk about like the business process of evaluating those partnerships? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, it's a good one that you call out. 
and one that we have uh, considered. So as we look at any opportunity like that, we really want to start with the consumer lens. So we do a lot of different interviews going going into consumers' houses, um, observing them, asking them what they expect to be happen in certain scenarios or, or what additional problems we think we could solve. So so in that one, um, you know, we would go out to customers and, and maybe put together some prototypes and, and say like, hey, this is this is the experience we're delivering. And, uh, you know, a lot of these these smart home experiences are, are ones that you really have to um, kind of see in person to really understand like what's going on. And so uh, some, sometimes doing, you know, man behind the curtain or man or woman behind the curtain to be able to do those control things so that we can really test out that full experience without having to go build it first. And so we'll do a lot of those types of scenarios um, either in our own demo homes that we have uh, both here uh, at our Vivint corporate uh, headquarters, as well as, um, you know, we have a lot of beta testers that we have across the country that we'll go work with or, or just customers will we'll reach out to and, and want to get their thoughts on. So so we really want to start with that consumer lens and and then, and then really kind of step back to and be like, OK, so that, that's a solution that that's one solution to helping solve a problem. But can we get really clear on what that problem is and make sure that we understand it inside and out? Because there may be, you know, two or three ways to solve that problem of, uh, you know, an animal coming onto my property and pooping on my property. Sprinklers is one way to do it. And I think that's a good way to do it. But there may be two or three others. And so, again, we want to make sure we're really, really clear on what the, the problem is that the customer has and, and not jumping too quickly to what solution we think could potentially go solve it. But th- then as we get start to converge around those solutions, we will then, then as I mentioned, go out and do the prototyping, really go kind of deep. Uh, get get feedback from consumers. The other advantage we have here at Vivint is we're, we're not only integrated on the on the vertical side where we uh, build the products, but we're also integrated on the channel side. And so that means that we build the products, we sell them, we install them, we monitor them, we service them, and that all provides different uh, mechanisms for feedback for us as well. As we have, you know, our, our sales reps talking to consumers every single day, they get a lot of new insights or. Our, our technicians who are doing the professional installation, they bring us back insights or, you know, any kind of reliability challenges that come up in the field. Like uh, all those are different mechanisms for us to then leverage as we go evaluate a, a potential new experience like the one you just described. And then it's really on the business side, business business and technical feasibility is, you know, does this make business sense for us? Every business model is a little bit different. Vivence is, is unique, as I mentioned, with the channel integration that we have and and, and the way that customers generally finance their equipment over time and customers stay with us for a really long time. I mean, they stay with us for years and years and years, which, which makes it also have a little bit of a different dynamic. And, and so we have to take all those things into account as we explore these, uh, these different uh, opportunities. With features like Smart Deter, y'all are building a lot of stuff on your hardware. How important is it for you to own the hardware that you're building the services on? When when you do start with that experience first view, you, you you begin with you know what what's that problem that we're solving, and then it's do we have do we have the ability to go do that? Do we already have that in place? And, and oftentimes, especially with something like Deter that that's novel that hasn't been done before, um, it does require you to go build your own hardware because you really have to take you know every component that every every part of the camera that's being considered is built with that end experience in mind. So, for instance, on that deter, uh, we did we added a 4K image sensor onto the camera, and it wasn't so that we could stream in 4K necessarily. Now we deliver you know a crisp 1080p stream, but it was really so that we could be able to at, at greater distances maintain our accuracy with our detection, with our analytics, because we knew that we needed to be really really accurate at detecting somebody if they were you know walking out around your car at nighttime or anything like that. So so that that went into our decision on the image sensor. It went into our decision on on how many LEDs that we put on the front of the camera because we decided we needed to have that light ring be really bright and, and you know attention grabbing. It, it went into the detail or it went into the decision on on what speaker we select. This thing had to be loud enough to grab attention, uh, you know, even if you were on a busier street or things like that. And so, uh, really, every component that goes into the camera is influenced by that end experience that we know that we want to deliver. And so if we decide that there's an end experience that we want to deliver and it doesn't require us to go build new hardware, then, then that's great too. And, and we won't. And we can either integrate a third party or, or leverage something that we already have. 
But but oftentimes, especially as you're pushing into these newer and newer experiences, like not just having a doorbell camera uh, tell you when a visitor's there, but actually actively monitor a, a delivery on your porch. The, the hardware has to be custom. It has to be built with that that entire experience in mind. Otherwise, it's it's not capable of delivering against it. And just to keep going a little bit further, I think I think one great example of that I was just kind of alluding to is that that package detection is there's different companies trying to help make uh, decreased porch pirates or, or people stealing packages off of doorsteps. But in order to do that, you can't really protect what you can't see. And so we've seen, you know, some some folks in the industry try to kind of retrofit that experience into their doorbell camera. And it's really hard. But what we did is we knew that was our end experience at the beginning. And so we built that 180 degree horizontal, but also 180 degree vertical field of view into the camera that made it so that we could always see when a package was delivered, even if it was right up against the right up against the door itself. So so th- th- that's where I think it really comes into like when do you decide to build your own versus partner versus, you know, buy something off the shelf. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Stacey. It was fun. Glad to, glad to be on. And that concludes this week's episode of the Internet of Things podcast. Please join us next Thursday and don't forget to subscribe. And if you can't get enough IoT news, I would love for you to sign up at www.stacyoniot.com for our weekly IoT newsletter, where we explain all kinds of things that we don't even get to on the show. Once again, thank you for listening and please subscribe. Subscribe.